up on the screen, we had, I think this is, what is, what is this, about the fifth feeding. This, if you remember, this goes back to November, and God laid it on my heart to feed people. And um, I wasn't sure if it was of God. And I did, I, I had, the way I had it in my mind was that um, we would be distributing food somewhere around locally for, for needy families, for maybe some senior citizens on limited income. All their money goes toward rent and medicine. That's kind of what I had in my mind. And I shared it with Michael. And Michael called his cousin, who helps run our radio stations out there. And she works a lot there in Turkana. And she called Michael back and she said, you know, there's people that starve to death up here in Turkana. You have to understand, Turkana is, I mean, it's the farthest, about the farthest you can get from Nairobi. Nairobi is where the central government is. So anything that far away usually just kind of gets left. About one of the, one of the few things they have going for them is they, they have oil up there, and there's some, I think, British Petroleum, and maybe some other companies are up there drilling for oil. So hopefully, you know, there'll be some oil revenue come in, give people some jobs and so on. But the people up there are very, very poor. And when you read the Bible, you read, you know, when Jesus stood up and read from the script, when they handed him the book of Isaiah, what he read was, you know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And, you know, while other churches, and I literally, I mean this, they literally seek out the wealthy neighborhoods to put a church in knowing that those people are going to give money. And um, so they deliberately, in my, in my opinion, they are deliberately leaving out impoverished areas because there's no money in it. So why build a church there when the, you know the people aren't going to support it? Very, very few men would actually seek something out. But that's where God put us. And so it, it, it just dawned on me that we would try to distribute food in Turkana. So the first feeding we did, um, a couple hundred, if I remember right. And then the next one we did, uh, when I announced it, that we had done this, and then just people just started giving. You guys, you can go back and look at the recordings. I don't ask people for money. If it's God's idea, God pays, God pays all the bills. And that's what he's done. And so the next time there were so many people that came out, we decided to, to not give to each one. We had one head from each family, one representative from each family, and they would come and we'd fill them a sack of corn, and then we'd give them a sack of beans, and um, hopefully enough for the family for a week, to eat for a week. Corn and, and beans are their staples, so I mean, that, their diet's fairly simple. Uh, they, they do without caviar and you know, steak and lobster. So, um, so we've done several feedings since then, different numbers, a couple hundred people, 300 people, 400 people, so on, 400 families and so on. And each time, the guys from the radio station will take out a loudspeaker and a little mixer board and they play one of the sermons that I preach here, they play that for them for something to listen to, and we give them the gospel. And various people have been saved as a result of that. And you know, even at that, everybody, somebody's going, somebody ignorant is going to criticize everything you do. And so we had people saved, and I, when I posted that on Facebook, the Facebook idiots come out, and they say, "Well, of course they got saved. You gave them food." That just, that gnaws to my bone. We're doing what God told us to do. We didn't demand that anybody had to follow our religion as a result of it. 
we'd do it again to the same people. And um, so it, you, you just have people like that. And uh, so this time around, when Michael went to look for bags of whole corn to give, couldn't find any. Corn, I, I don't know where, the, where it all went. So we, we found individual bags of corn meal, which that's what they're going to do with it anyway. They grind it down and they make their... It's funny how they eat. They make this little goo out of cornmeal, and they pick that goo up with their hand, and they dip it in their stew or whatever, and they eat it like that. So maybe one of these days we'll distribute forks and spoons to them. that would help them out. I don't know. But anyway, but, um, it, as long as they're eating. So we, we were able to give out not just the cornmeal and the beans as well, but we even found little, little bottles of oil cooking oil to give to them because they need oil along with it. And so these are some of the pictures of the feeding that we did Friday. Now all this, all this is going on. Michael went over there and when he comes back I want you to give him a big hug and a kiss. Okay? Because that man labored. We did the pastor's conference in Turkana. He got everything set up there including all the streaming technology on their end so that I could just sit at home and for three and a half hours Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, then I would teach the pastors and give them basic understanding. You have to understand, nobody goes up there. Nobody goes up there and ministers for those people. They're just, they're too far away. People don't know about them. I didn't know anything about them until they brought it up about putting a radio station there. So the pastors, the men, they were thanking, very, very thankful for our church, for having a heart. The pastors were asking Michael, how did... How did Bethel know about us? How did they even know we were here? It was what they were asking. It just, they were just, and I tell them, Michael, tell them God loves them. God knew where they were. God knew what they needed. And God picked a church to bless them. And it's this church. Um, there's our team that works at our radio station. I've met them. And uh, you pray for them. Pray because they're ministers, just like any of us would be. So lift them up. There's Michael there. There's the crowd. 1,300 families showed up Friday. 1,300 families we fed for a week. You probably can't see it. I've, I got tickled. This lady's, you know, they get clothes sent over from everywhere in the world. And the back of her shirt says, World Toilet Day. I swear to say, I, had, I didn't know that was a day. But it says World Toilet Day, so. There they are praying that has their hands lifted toward heaven. And uh, there's a video there. I, I, I can't play it on this deal, so... Uh-oh. Come on. There we go. That blessed my heart. I bawled like a baby. Just an old woman. Skinny. Michael, they're praying with her. Pray for them, people. Amen. Take your Bible, turn to Titus, chapter 2. I'm going to be a shepherd today. I'm going to be a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now don't you listen to me. For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know what the rod and the staff is for?
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First, Second Thessalonians, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus. There it is. I found it. Had to sing the song for us before I got there. You know what the rod and staff is for? The staff got a little crook in it. Kind of give them a pull back. Okay? That's what the, the staff, the shepherd's staff. Got a little crook in it, and it's to reach out to the sheep, pull them back in. Because, listen now, it's dangerous when you're not in the fold. Amen? It's dangerous when you're not in the fold. Now the rod is for the ones you can't hook back in. You might have to take the rod and hit them back in. Because sheep ain't that smart. Amen? And sometimes we get a little rebellious in us. And we think grass is greener outside the fold. But the rod also is there in case the wolves show up. Who's going to protect the sheep? The rod is. The shepherd is. Okay? And, um, but he said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, I want you to think about it. Now, when you were a child, your mom and daddy, Ed, was, you know, just thinking about your mom and dad, you said your dad whooped you. Okay? Are you angry about that at all? Mad at your dad because he hit you? No. Same reason why you whipped your children. Because you see it now. You get it. You understand. There's danger in Ferguson, Missouri. It's dangerous up there. There's danger in Jefferson County, Missouri. It's dangerous. When, we, when our kids get away from us. I knew in my neighborhood where I grew up, I knew where the bad kids were. And that's who I went after. And my mama had to take a belt to me to keep me away from them because she knew it wasn't good. I mean, I knew the kid that had playboys in his room. Okay? So that's why I went up there. Because his mom and dad let him have them. My mom had to take a belt to me, keep me away from him. That boy was dangerous to me. And she knew it. Okay? So, Titus chapter 2. Let's read the Bible this morning. Let's speak thou things which become sound doctrine. The aged men. That's why I like old men in our church. The aged men be sober. Grave. That means serious. About the Lord's business. Temperate. Which means they're able to control their temper. Sound in faith. In charity, which is what we're doing. We're giving away things for people that may never give anything back to us. Except, I'll tell you, the video will show you. They're clapping, they're singing and they're singing praise and thanks to Bethel Church. But other than that, we're not getting any money out of it. The, but the aged men are, are sound in charity and in patience. I try to be patient as a pastor. Long suffer with people. Verse 3, the aged women likewise. Now look, look at this word here, behavior. So... I want you to hang with me this morning. It's going to, we're, I'm going to spend a little time today. This is the Lord's day. And our church needs this. Because behavior is not what it should be. Behavior. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers. 
not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to, what does that say? Love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. You know what that means? You don't walk around with your stuff hanging out of your clothes. To be discreet. You don't, let, you don't talk about certain things in public. My goodness. Sister Bernice and Sister Hazel would come after you if you said the word pregnant. They said, we didn't talk that way when we were young. They were discreet. Chaste. Keepers at home. Why? Why? Why do women have to be keepers at home? That's, that's that old fat, that's caveman stuff, right? Beat them on the head, club them in the head, drag them by the hair, and tell them to stay in the cave. Listen, God knows what he's talking about, ladies. He knows, listen to me, he knows while you're out in the workplace, there's a wolf out there wanting to be in bed with you. He knows when you're out being, who was that lady on Bewitch, Mrs. Kravitz? She was always knocking on the door with a cup in her hand trying to figure out what was going on in the house over there. She was the town watch lady. One know what, peeking out the window, looking at everybody, see what they were doing, right? Keepers at home, good. Obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God be not what? We believe in the King James Bible here, don't we? Don't blaspheme that book. You, with your behavior, blaspheme the very book that you say you believe in. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, how much is all things? In all things, showing thyself a pattern of what? Good works. All things. A pattern of good works. You are building your own reputation. And then you wonder why people think about you what they think about you. You did it to yourself. Showing thyself a pattern of good works. And doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you some questions this morning. I want the, the title of this message is, Who is? And I want to read a list of things and ask you, Who is doing this? Now, it's not going to be me accusing. But I'm going to read some things to you. Having no evil thing to say about you. So, what do people know about you? What does people know about you? Inside or outside of this church. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Boy, that's something you don't hear preached anymore. Oh, that's slavery. That's bad. That shouldn't be in the Bible. Listen, God doesn't condone slavery, but He'll teach you how to live while you're under it. And then maybe, just maybe, God will make you free. But then th there's another aspect of this. If you work for somebody, are you not their servant? Are they not your master? Should you not, at your workplace, be well thought of as well thought of as you are in church? See, what's, what's sickening to me is when people sit in church and amen and act, they act all, all holy and nice and everything like that. And they go to work. They constantly complain about their work. Constantly complain about their boss. Look for ways of getting out of work. And a lot of that union hall business is not biblical. I don't care if you don't like that or not. Most of what goes on in a union hall is unbiblical. I know everybody's got to have a job. Sometimes it's got to be a union job, okay? But you be careful. 
about what you're falling in line with at work. Um, not purloining. I think that means you're not leaning on the shovel. Don't lean on the shovel. Pick the shovel up and use it. Go to work. Amen? Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So, maybe there's a reason why you didn't invite people you work with to come to church with you. Maybe it's because they know you're a joke. I haven't even prayed the prayer yet. Uh, for the grace of God to bring a salvation that appeared to all men, teaching us, and here it is right here, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Can I hear God's people say amen? Father in heaven, I would just soon... Go sit down. The God, you laid this message on my heart. There's some things I got to say. Some things going on that are not right. And it has got to stop. God, your blessing, part of this church. And that's not satisfactory to me. I would want you to bless all of this church. But Father, we have to live right. We have to live right. And Father, I'm not... I can't accuse people. But God, you know who is and who isn't. And so, Father, for the, for the sake of the rod and the staff this morning, for the sake of the honor of the rod and the staff, God, would you convict hearts today? Starting with mine, and then going to my wife, and then to my daughters, then to my sons, my family first, and then all of these fine people here today, and even those that are not here. So Father, would you help me preach what needs to be preached and say what needs to be said? And Father, there's wolves out there that I know are already working to tear the sheep up in this church. And God, I've had it. I've had it with them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would just bless us. Because there's hungry people out there. That I want you to use us to feed them. Not somebody else. I want you to use us to do it. Father, it's the greatest thing, in my opinion, that you have ever done with this church you did it this week and I want these people to get the blessing out of that for being a part of that Father bless your word today and help me preach today in Jesus name and all of God's people said amen 1 Corinthians 13 I'm going to give you some scriptures and I'm going to ask you I'm going to ask you some I'm going to run down a list of things 1 Corinthians 13, 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Now here's the, here's the word again, behave. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly. Now I'm going to ask you this morning about your behavior. About your behavior. About how you act and what you're doing. I want to ask you, are you is what you're doing right? 
Now, you may be sitting there sweating going, who's he, who's he talking to? Oh, I hope, he's talking to some, I hope he's talking to somebody else. I wonder who it is. Don't do that. Just assume that I know something on you. I've done that before. I've preached messages specifically for one person in this church. Because I found out something they did. And I was not happy about it. I didn't name names. Okay? Now, there are some things that I know. But I also know we have a church full of sinners. Do we not? Does not God forgive sins? You know, something that I don't like but I guess it's the nature of how it works. The preacher's always the last one to hear about it. Right? And I just want to say to you, there hasn't been anybody that's come to me telling me something they've been doing that I've punched them in the mouth over it, hit them with a baseball bat, pulled a gun on them, or thrown them out over it. Not one. I had a man come to me several years ago admitting what he was looking at on the internet. It was bothering him and he came to me and admitted I prayed with him, forgave it, it's over with. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. Now some things I just kind of pray about, but there's at least one thing that I'm going to have to go to somebody personally and confront them. And I am not looking forward to it. But I'm going to have to do it. And it may get to the point where we have to have a church meeting and I hope to God it doesn't go that far. But there's a, there's, this, there's a rule that there's rules that we have to follow. If we know somebody's done something wrong, we're supposed to go to them in love with correction in mind. Because we'll be the next ones that fall into sin. Won't we? So if I want, if I would want myself to be forgiven and restored, then I must want that for somebody else. And I guarantee you, I've done it that way every time. But some of the behavior is just uncalled for, and it has to stop. Or let's just quit being a church. Because charity behaveth not itself unseemly. It seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, it thinketh no evil, it rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Now Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, These things write I unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know that thou, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Shouldn't you already know by now? which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. So what he's saying is, he's not just talking about how you act here. Although, there are things that go on here during church service I am not happy with. Not happy with it. There should be a certain respect for the house of God and for the service of God. Okay? But then it extends itself, how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. So that really applies everywhere we go. You're the house of God, are you not? So isn't there a way that we're supposed to behave ourselves? 
Man, I tell you what, Sister Linda and Brother Sterling, some of you, you know, man, I, if I was running in this church when I was a boy, I always turned the corner and there was James Waymire standing right there. He did not put up with that, no sir. You did not bring chewing gum into the house of God. You did not bring a soda cup into the house of God. And to this day, I don't bring a soda cup. Even during the week, I don't do it. You know, little things like that. It, it just, it's a heart that shows respect for the house of God. Amen? So, shouldn't you already know how to behave yourself when you're in God's house? Amen. John chapter 15, he said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Now, I will say this. Part of the problem has to do with love for the brethren. Or a lack thereof today I was supposed to start a sermon series on the two commandments love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself okay I can't get to that until I deal with this but he said John 13 34 a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I loved you that you also love one another by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another Love, charity, long-suffering, patience with one another. There, and I will say this, you listen to me. There is no love in gossip. There's no love in gossip. There's no love in backbiting. There's no love in backstabbing. There's no love in accusations. And I've had it up to here with them. Had it. And I have every reason in the world to believe that they are sourced from outside of this church by a bitter person who used to be in here. Who are you talking about, Brother Mike? I've had it. This person has accused Gloria of being the church Jezebel. False accusations laid toward her. And I am not down with that. But some of that stuff is sourced from outside of this place trying to destroy inside of this place. And there is not a chance in the world that I as your shepherd am going to allow that to go on. Yeah, I know things that most of you don't know. And I sit up at night. I worry myself to death. I worry about you guys. Do you not think that what you saw on the screen a while ago was the work of God? Was it? Wouldn't you like to get a blessing from God for just being a part of that by being part of this church? So that's what I want. I don't take the credit for that. Every time I talk about anything that comes out of this church, I say it's us doing it, not me. Us. It's because I want you guys to have a part of that. But the behavior is going to ruin it. So Romans chapter 1, turn your Bible there. So I'm going, to ask you, I'm going to ask you some hard questions. 
Now, you folks online, you might as well just jump in on this. Because I know if it goes on here, it's going on there. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Look at your Bible. Here's what I'm going to tell you. If you will retain God in your knowledge, you won't be doing some of that nonsense. If you'll put God in his kingdom first, some of that stuff you'll cut out. So even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That happens. I've seen it happen. And it will happen to you. To do those things which are not convenient. So, the question is, who is? Number one. Who's living in unrighteousness? Whose conduct is unrighteous and unbecoming a child of God? Whose is? Now remember, there are some things that I know but I also know that there are things that I don't know. But God does. So I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm hoping God does. I'm hoping that if you're doing things in secret, that God will whoop the fire out of you and he'll drive it out of you before I find out about it. Or before anybody else finds out about it. That's what I hope. You know why I hope that? Because I hope that for me. That God will beat the fire out of me. And deal with me. So nobody else finds out. Um, who is fornicating? Who's looking at pornography? Who is? Whose mind is full of wickedness during the week? Who's got covetousness nature about them? You lust after every woman or every man or every girl, every boy. You lust after new cars, new trucks, new houses, new this, new that. Merchandise, material things. That's, that's just as wicked as looking at Playboy. Who's being malicious? Trying to get back at somebody. Who is full of envy about what somebody has or what somebody's doing or what somebody's getting that you're not getting? Maybe you're, maybe you're full of murder. You're thinking you want somebody dead. Is wanting somebody dead a sin? God said so. God said in the book of James that you hate your brother just like thou shalt not kill. Murder. Who is full of debate. You sit here and listen to what I say, but then you go home and you argue with about half of what I preach. Who is, I don't know, who is? Who is doing that? Who is it that lies and full of deceit? Your life is full of cover-ups. 
because you don't want anybody to find out what you did. Or when confronted about things, you'll lie to somebody's face. Who is malignant? You know what that, you know what that, let's think about what we use the word malignant about. Cancerous. Cancers eat things up. Who is so malignant that they malign people? Why would somebody call Gloria a Jezebel? You know what Ron used to say, me, say about me, Sterling? Hogger didn't do it. Hogger don't do anything. That's what he used to say. I know Hogger didn't do it. Hogger don't do anything. And I would go, yeah, wait a minute. Who is maligning people behind their back? Who's our whisperers? Look at your Bible. Very end of verse 29. Who's our whisperers? You know what that is, don't you? Gospers. Let me tell you what I found out about so-and-so. You, we know that everybody in this church does something wrong, right? We know that God can convict everybody, right? We also know that if we know somebody's done something and it's a pretty serious thing, that we have to go to them with the spirit of reconciliation. Right? There he did not say one word in the scriptures about telling everybody else first and then going to somebody. And there are things that I know that people in this church have done serious things that I'm keeping to myself until I go to them and I am going. Wouldn't you be glad that I did it that way if it was you? So who is our whisperers? Who is our backbiters? They kind of go the same. That's the same thing, isn't it? And I'm telling you, the backbiting has got to stop. Do we have haters of God here? Well, now wait a minute. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And there's only two of them. Love the Lord your God. Now, I may just preach word for word how Reg Kelly preached this one time. Because he said, everything that you've done wrong starts out with you didn't love God. And that's why you did it. Right? Who's our despiteful people? Doing things just to spite somebody else. I don't care if they deserved it. That is conduct unbecoming a saint. Who's our proud, who is our proud people? Too proud to think that this sermon's for them. Too proud to ever admit that you're wrong. Who is boasters? Inventors of evil things. I don't think we have any inventors here. Everybody listen now. Who is disobedient to parents? You know, you can be an adult 
and be guilty of that. Right? The Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. He did not put an age restriction on that. And you can be guilty of dishonoring your parents, even as an adult. And you know what? I, I would say that to my own children sitting right here. Don't dishonor your parents, children. You break our heart. You know, that I, I don't see it on the list anywhere here. Maybe I missed it. Who's our thieves? Did you know that people have stolen things and I know it? I know it. Why would you do that? What about stealing from God? Will a man rob God? How do you rob God? How does he say it? In tithes and offerings. I don't look. Rose will tell you, I do not look at the deposits. I don't look at who, what, who gives what. I don't do that. I don't do it on purpose. I don't think it's a good idea for me to do it. I stay away from that. So I don't know who does and who doesn't. But I know churches, and I would just take a guess, it's probably somebody here that don't tithe, don't give. You know what? You're stealing from God. You're a thief. Who is, who is without understanding? Who is, who is our covenant breakers? Now, don't tell nobody. Oh, I promise. I promise I won't tell anybody. Who's ever, who's ever quit paying on stuff that you bought? That's a covenant breaker. You signed agreement, you signed a covenant, and then you didn't pay it back. That's a thief and a covenant breaker. You stole that. You don't own it. You stole it. You're a covenant breaker, you're a thief. Without natural affection, you love yourself more than you love anybody else, including your own family. Now get everybody. Who is that? Who, who is doing these things? Some of them I know. Some of them I don't. But I know God does. And I could either continue to just sidestep everything so I don't make anybody mad. So I don't run anybody out. I don't want to run anybody out of this church. Look around you. I, I got half empty. I got most empty pews sitting here already. I want you to think about something. Why is it that outside of this church is growing exponentially, but inside this church, there's nothing? Maybe that's my fault. I think that a lot. In fact, most of the time, I think that it's me. And there's been a couple times, more than a couple times, I thought, maybe I need to step aside, let somebody else come in.
I've asked God to be, for me personally to be like Job. The Bible says Job eschewed evil. What that means is he just flat refused to let his flesh control him. He refused to do it. We're lacking some godly men in this church. And without godly men, we will never be able to do what God commands us to do as a church. We need godly men. Amen? And I'm asking the men that are here to step up. And beg God to make you a godly man. I'm asking that. And I'm asking our ladies, young and old, to be godly ladies. That know that there is a time to speak and a time to not speak. I can say that. I'm supposed to. Because God tells me to say things like that. Amen? I want as much as possible for God to just wipe some sin out of this church. But keep the sinners here. That's my preference. I'll, I'll keep the sinners. And I'll love you. And I'll pray for you. And I'll work with you and try to do what I can. So that we just get away from the old life. The old Bethel. But if you're going to keep in the sin. And it's just like a cancer. got to come off. Amen? So, now you have. Because I'm going to do something different today. I asked the question, who is? If you were one of those people that when I said, who is, like this, if you were one of those people, I'm going to ask you to be bold enough to get up out of your pew and to walk down here to one of these benches.